Good evening, Lifelink friends. Welcome again to another evening. We're halfway through our study after tonight, week five. Our, week, our study is ten, ten weeks long, and we're looking forward to what God has done and will do uh, throughout the summer. I just do want to say thank you uh, to all of those, of, uh, to all of you who have hosted uh, one of these groups in your home. Really appreciate your ministry. And I also want to say thank you to all those that are leading the groups and uh, just appreciate your, your servant's heart and your willingness to serve the Lord. And uh, for each of you, for coming, being part, participating, and uh, pray that God is encouraging you through this, through this study. Well, tonight we come to the Discipline of Biblical Musing, Part 2. Now, last week, we saw how important it was for our minds to be renewed, and, and a way to do that is by musing on the works of God. And again, we need that because it, it, we, we can't have our minds conform to this world. Our minds must be renewed so that we can prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God, so we can please God right, with our lives. And the battle that takes place for our minds, so they have to be renewed. And there are some disciplines that we must embark on. And so last week we saw the discipline of musing on the uh, works of God. Today, tonight, I want to invite you to join me in Psalm 119, where we will see the discipline of musing on the Word of God. The Word of God. And we're going to again answer some questions. Uh, we'll begin with this. What does it mean to muse on the Word of God? Of God. What does it mean to muse on the Word of God? I, I thought I'd begin by um, maybe answering what it does not mean first as we answer that question. Um, because here's what it does not mean. It does not mean necessarily just going to church. It, it does not mean just opening my Bible and quickly reading it, for example. In other words, it doesn't mean check my mind at the door when I read God's Word or am in attendance uh, for the preaching of God's Word. You see, James 1, verse 22, says, Be, hearers of the, uh, be doers of the Word and not hearers only, uh, deceiving yourselves. We can become a forgetful hearer. Right? You forget. That's not meditating on the Word. That's not having it dwell in you and renew your mind by it. You, you, you're, you're showing up and it's in one ear and out the other. No, that's not what... Uh, biblical musing is about. Uh, so it's not checking my mind at the door, nor is it checking out when I'm done reading or listening to God's Word. And, and, a, and a third thing which it's not, it's not checking God's Word in accordance to my thinking. Uh, some people spend time in God's Word and they're like, oh, oh yeah, but I think this way. Now that's not what we're meaning by meditating on God's Word. It's not checking God's Word in accordance to my thinking. We're going to see it's going to be the other way around, allowing my thinking to be conformed to the Word of God. God's Word is the standard. His Word is perfect. So let's move on. What does it mean? Then? That's not what it, that's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean just showing up or quickly reading one ear out the other. It doesn't mean checking um, God's Word in accordance to my thinking. What does it mean? Well, meditating on God's Word, thinking on God's Word, so that God's Word controls my thinking, and therefore my life is transformed by the Word of God. To think biblically about every area of life is another way to think about what it means to muse. When, I, when I've arrived at musing the way I ought to muse on the Word of God, what will it look like? What will it mean? It will mean I'm thinking biblically and then choosing to live accordingly regarding every area of life. See, another thing in meditation in the world, meditation often is associated with emptying your minds. Emptying our minds. But musing in the Bible always has a subject which we're musing on. For example, last week it was God's works. This week, we're going to see it's another good and wholesome subject, the, the perfect Word of God. It's filling our minds with God's Word. And so when we muse on God's Word, we're filling our minds on God's Word. And so the Word of God, think about that subject just for a moment. Words. God has communicated. 
And as a believer, it's the one who has loved me more than anyone else could ever love me. And he's given to me a message. It's found in these 66 books. Yes, some of them are written to specific people in specific contexts. But I ultimately have a book which describes God. And it's his word. It's his word. Can, uh, and you could probably remember, just think about this for a moment, receiving a note from someone special in your life. Perhaps for you it was a, a father or a mother or a son or a daughter or, or a spouse-to-be or your current spouse, you know, whatever it might be, someone that is just uh, special to you. And as you receive that word, you, you treasured it. You read it. You reread it. You thought about it. You allowed those words to control you to the point that you could even quote some of them. And your life became impacted by those words. This is the heart of, of musing or meditating on the Word of God. But the object of it here is something far better than any other human love letter we might receive. It is the very Word of God. The message is from God Himself. Not just another human, even though they might be a very special human being to us. It's from God Himself. Well, with our Bibles open to Psalm 119, we, we want to just think on this psalm. It's interesting. It's, it's the longest psalm. It's not technically a chapter. Uh, you recognize that. The, the psalms are like a hymn book. And, uh, for example, when we open up our hymn book, we don't open it up to chapter 1. No, it's, you know, it's hymn number 1, or hymn number 2, or hymn number 10, or whatever number it is. And, and so, likewise, in the Psalms, we don't address them as chapters. We call them in, in numbers, because they're all individual songs. And so, Psalm 119 is the longest psalm. But if you were to compare it with all the other chapters in the Bible, it would be the longest chapter as well. But it's a, it's a song. It's an individual psalm. And uh, it contains 119, or 176 verses. And all but six of them, uh, very specifically, talk about the Word of God. H has the Word right in it. The other six allude to the Word of God in some form or some way. But... Notice, notice the different terms which he uses, but the, the object of this psalm, the focus of this psalm, is the Word of God. Uh, look, look at verse 1. We'll just read a couple of these verses. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord. That's the Word of God, right? Verse 2. Blessed are those who keep His testimonies. Testimonies. Another word pointing back to the Word of God. Verse 3, uh, they also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. His ways here point to the word of God. You have commanded us, verse 4, to keep your precepts. Again, the words of God. Verse 5, uh, to keep your statutes. The end of verse 6, when I look into all your commandments. Verse 7, the end of it, when I learn your righteous judgments. Verse 8, I will keep your statutes. There's statutes, judgments, commandments, statutes. And you can go through this whole psalm and they just keep pointing us to the Word of God. And it just uses different terms to describe it in this psalm. But there's something else very special about this psalm. Um, and you, you probably have it with your Bibles open. Um, you may, maybe even you want to compare your Bibles. If, if you want to stop the tape, you're welcome to do this during this time. But uh, um, it, it, behind and in front of my Bible, uh, before you get to verse 1, you have this funny looking letter. It almost looks like an X, uh, special calligraphy X, if you will. And then in my Bible, it also has the word Aleph. And you might be thinking, what in the world is that funny symbol, that X, if you will? And then, what in the world does Aleph mean? And then you go eight verses later, you have another uh, symbol. Uh, it kind of looks like a square minus the one side there. It's where it's open. And then you have the word Beth. And then you, you go down a little bit further and you have another one and eight verses later it's Gimel and another symbol that's there. What are these funny symbols? Why are they there? Well, the psalmist was meditating on God's Word. And as he was meditating and thinking about the commandments, the law, the statutes, and all those things, he, he broke out into what is one of the most beautiful psalms from a poetry perspective ever written. In the first eight verses, all begin 
with the Hebrew letter Aleph, which looks like that funny little X, if you will. And then the next eight verses all begin in the Hebrew with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Beth. And that's why there's 176 verses, because you go through the eight, um, uh, eight, eight verses for each letter, you end up with 176, and you go all the way from A, if you will, Aleph, to Z, which in the Hebrew letter, the last letter of the alphabet is Tau, and all the way from, from Aleph to Tau. And he's just describing the Word of God in these eight um, sections of eight verses. And what he's saying here is this, God's Word covers everything from A to Z. God's Word is complete. It's full. It's overflowing. That's perhaps why he used eight. Seven being the perfect number. Eight, one more than this. It's full and it's overflowing. It has everything we need. It is something worthy to meditate on. And at least six times in this psalm, we find the Hebrew word sayak, uh, which I mentioned last week. Uh, but it, it's translated meditate. And what I want you to do is just read these verses together. Uh, verses, verse 15, 23, 27, 48, 78, and 148. And just see, this psalmist, he's meditating. And this is such a worthwhile endeavor to meditate on the works, or on the Word of God. I'll be back in a moment, just after you read these six verses. Well, we're beginning to think about what it means to meditate on the Word of God, thinking deeply about this book and the special Word that we have received from the Lord. But let's move on to the second question, how should I meditate on the Word of God? And, and we want to focus in on verses 97 through 104. We, we could have picked many other spots in the Scriptures for this, many other spots even in the Psalm, but for the sake of time, we'll just look at uh, these verses, 97 through 104. And, and, and again, this is not exhaustive for how I should meditate on the Word of God, but I hope it will give you something to think about and encourage you as you seek to develop this discipline of musing on the Word of God. Um, and what I want you to see here is a cycle. There, there's a cycle in this psalm, if you will, that I think would encourage us in the process of meditating on the Word of God. And it begins in verse 97 with this, Oh, how I love your law. The first part of the cycle is there needs to be a love for it. Uh, and, and I think Peter describes it this way. In, in 1 Peter 2, 2 through 3, he says, oh, We... Um, um, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. There's a desire for it. There's a longing for it. There's a love for it. Why? If so be, you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. You've understood he's gracious. In other words, we love him because he what? First loved us. And when you love him, you're going to love his words. Just like that letter you received from someone special. Right? There's a love there. Love. The love of the Word is rooted in our love of the Lord. In other words, if you don't want to spend time in this book, if you're having a hard time even opening this book, let alone meditating or musing on it, hard time even wanting to be in church, the, the issue might go back to your love for the Lord. Your love, and, and go right to the cross where He loved us. And fall in love again with Him. It might need, mean dealing with sin in our lives and so on and so forth. Because um, uh, if we're loving His law, it, it, it's, it's because um, we're dealing with sin, right? If we, um, if we want to live any way we want, we don't love His law. We like our law, if you will. So the first word in the cycle is love. And as you love His word, that leads to the next part, which is, I use three words here in this cycle, and they all kind of are interrelated. They all kind of go together. Listening, learning, and lingering. You have to listen. You love it, but you got to somehow hear it. you got to somehow uh, read it, be in it. There's a listening to it. Verses 98 and 99. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. How are they with me? 
because I've at least heard it somewhere along the way. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. It's lingering there. I, I've learned from it. I have understanding, but then it lingers. It stays with me. Um, and you see that there. So the love provides the desire. This point requires the discipline. There's a discipline here still, isn't there? I have to take time to listen to the Word of God. I have to, in that listening, allow it to teach me. And, and I need to learn from it. And, and then as I go from the learning, I can't be a forgetful here. It has to linger. I have to chew on it over and over again. Um, and that reviewing it, remaining in it, remembering it. And, uh, I, you know, I'd encourage you, even, you know, maybe many of you start in the morning with your scripture reading. And that's a great way to practice this, right? Put God's Word in your mind right away. And, and then as you go throughout the day, set up some checkpoints. One of the things that I uh, have done in my life from time to time is just thinking about I like to eat, right? And I usually have three meals. And so I, I have some natural checkpoints. And as I sit down for lunch, I'm thinking, what did I learn this morning? What was the spiritual food that God gave to me and put in my heart? And causes me for it to linger a little bit longer. And then at night for dinner, and if I have a late night snack of ice cream or whatever it might be, have it there too. So there's love. Then there's a listening, a learning, and a lingering of God's Word in our mind. And, and then it, it affects our life. A meditating on God's Word so it affects our life. And you can see that in verses 100 through 102. He says, I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your Word. And uh, uh, verse 102, I have not departed from your judgments. In other words, it's affecting his life. And then here's the beautiful thing that happens. And this is why I call it a cycle. When you prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, it's perfect. It's good. It's well-pleasing to you and ultimately to God. You're growing in this relationship because of what God's Word is doing in your life. You're being transformed. That's a good thing. You know what it's going to lead to? You're going to long for more. You're going to long for more. Look at Psalm 119, verse 103. How sweet are your words to my mouth. Sweeter than honey to my mouth, through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. In other words, I'm hating what's false, and I'm loving even more. I'm longing even more for your word. See the cycle? It starts off with the love. And then it, and it goes through of this listening, learning, and, and lingering. It affects our life. And then as it gets fleshed out, I'm like, man, this is so good. This is so good. And your, your soul uh, thirsts for more. How sweet are your words to my taste. Well, why should I meditate on God's Word? And in a sense, we've already answered that to some degree. Uh, but in short, your mind is renewed so that you will prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What a privilege to muse and ponder over the Scriptures, the very words of God. Personal blessing awaits. And again, just in this psalm, let me just share briefly three of them with you. As you muse on the Word of God. First, you will gain wisdom. You will gain wisdom. I love 98 through 100. I love the pictures that are there. You through your commandments make me wiser than my enemies. Oh, we like that one, right? But notice the next one. Um, I have more understanding than all my teachers. Now, he's not saying teachers are bad, right? But what's better than any human teacher? Who's going to be the best teacher? It's God. And, and here's the psalmist saying, I have more understanding than all my teachers. The teachers are supposed to be smarter than the students. Why is that? Where does he gain this wisdom from? It's from the, the Word of God. Uh, verse 100, I understand more than the ancients, the old. And Why? Because he's been meditating on the Word of God. It gives him wisdom. I love how the first psalm even begins. The blessed man. He doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but instead, what is it? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law, he meditates day and night. It's a blessed man. It's going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He's going to gain wisdom. It's going to impact his life. Here's a second truth. When you meditate on God's Word, you restrain your feet from sin. You restrain your feet from sin. Now, we're going to speak more on this even next week as we think about the discipline of memorizing. That'll be next week. But um, 
But just think for a moment here what he says, uh, verse 101, I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. It's so good, he understands that. And he's like, okay, I'm meditating on it. It's going to help me defeat sin. As he's thinking about it, meditating on it. But imagine this, if every person in America, young or old, right, went from pursuing amusements to biblical musing. Did you say, man, we need to focus on the word of God. I believe the, the world will be a better place when this generation, the generation to come, take time to think deeply, to meditate on the Word of God, to allow that to control their thinking. And, and here's the third benefit, why I should meditate on the Word of God, and it's been alluded to throughout this, but uh, you have the best teacher ever. You will have the best teacher ever. And I love the connection between verse 97, oh, how I love your law, um, to the verse 102, uh, I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. Who's the you yourself? It's the Lord God who has given to him the law. And he recognizes this. He says, what I have here is a, is a textbook, if you will, from God to teach me, to teach me who He is, who I am, and how I need to live. How I need to come to Christ, believe in Christ, and then live for His honor and for His glory. It's interesting, the other day I was talking to someone about graduate school for music majors. And here's the important consideration that I was told about that. It's this, who will you be studying under? More important than the name of the school or anything like that, it's who will your teacher will be? Who will be your teacher? That's important to choose when, you, when you're going to different schools. Who's going to be teaching me? After all, you go to school to learn, right? And to be taught. Well, when you meditate on the scriptures, your teacher is God himself. Uh, Psalm uh, verse 102 again makes that very clear. The emphasis, for you, but then he says, you yourself have taught me. Here's some beauties about this. The tuition is free. It only takes your time and your energy. But you can be taught by the best teacher ever. He knows everything. Take time to treasure what he says. It will give you wisdom for your life. It will keep you from sin. And you will have the best and wisest teacher ever. As we muse on his word. As we take time to allow our, our mind to be renewed so that we can do what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, in conclusion tonight, take time to share maybe some even more practical insights, maybe something you've been musing on from the scriptures that has helped you. And maybe how do you go about this practice of musing? And we can learn from one another, how you muse on the Word of God, how you meditate on it throughout the day. So take time to share those things and or if there's something specific that you've been thinking about from the scriptures that has really encouraged you and helped you. And may God encourage you the rest of this night at Life. And look forward to being back next week as we continue our study to muse or be amused. God bless you. Have a great evening.